Hey everyone, today I just want to answer some questions I had about um, the findings of uterine fibroids and how to effectively treat them. Well, as you know, I'm not a doctor. I have studied endocrinology as post-grad, but I want to give you some thoughts and thinkings here on, on why the treatment of uh, fibroids and how it's addressed is fundamentally wrong. Now, fibroids can occur usually because there's an excess of estrogen, but the thinking is to block uh, progesterone, which makes absolutely no sense and is really the, 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 the uh, subject of a whole other video blog. So what I'm going to talk about now is, first of all, this key study by Kim et al. that found that there was a relationship with the findings of thyroid nodules, either benign or malignant, and um, uterine fibroids. Now, the linking factor here was the uh, excess or the production of estrogen. Now that makes sense because estrogen's primary role is one of tissue proliferation, um, progesterone's role is to keep that in check. So if we're finding that thyroid nodules and uterine fibroids are linked, we perhaps need to look at the mechanisms of thyroid function and perhaps how estrogen inactivates thyroid um, and also increases TSH. And that's a subject we're going to look at. In this particular study, they found that um, Women who had um, who were premen premenopausal had uh, thyroid nodules in about 34 percent. In postmenopausal, it was about 45 percent. And the findings of uterine fibroids in premenopausal was 40 percent, and that flipped to postmenopausal about 34 percent. So I actually start to get us thinking of why is it that females are told that during the menopause that the loss of estrogen is instrumental in uh, the symptoms and negative symptoms associated with menopause and yet here we're finding here that estrogen is affecting um more women postmenopause. that might be due to to the incidence of aromatase and the conversion of other hormones into um an excess of estrogen particularly if there's extra adipose tissue and again that's the, that's a whole other subject so what we're finding here is uterine fibroids and thyroid nodules it's interesting to note that out of that study, approximately 16, 70% of pre and postmenopausal women had dual findings of thyroid nodules and uterine fibroids. So if we're going to start using contraceptive pills that either act in a very similar manage, uh, action to estrogen, what we found in some of the studies is that the estrogen is not actually decreased you may get a loss of some of the symptoms, but also the fi fibroid volumes in a lot of the studies didn't actually change at all. And this is backed up in the Cochrane reports that shows that fibroid volumes were not decreased with this particular therapy. Now we should start to look at some of the issues that kind of underlie this particular relationship. It's well known that environmental estrogens uh, affect thyroid function and mimic estrogen and shut off how the cells function effectively and could also push you to almost like a diabetic state because you lose the ability to utilize carbohydrate effectively. Now what happens is when the thyroid loses effectiveness, we start to produce more serum TSH. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone and it's the, the ther uh, sorry, it's the, um, it's the hormone that's produced in the pituitary that causes uh, more TSH to be produced. And hopefully what should happen is there should be more production of T4 and T3. But sometimes this doesn't happen. Ray Pete has made the distinction that any client or patient that he's seen in the past, that any patient who had a TSH above two rarely presented with good health, and perhaps most TSH levels should be below one. This is frowned upon within the, the, the endocrine, um, most, of, most of the endocrine uh, circles, who really think that the hypothyroidism isn't really diagnosed until you have a TSH above four or so. Now, in the scientific literature, there are actually plenty of studies that show that when serum TSH increases, you have an increased risk of thyroid cancer. So there are two points to consider here. Either one, TSH is just not a, an effective uh, tool for, for analyzing, or two, the TSH values that we also have at the moment are so ineffective. For example, if we go back and look at our study from uh, Kim et al, it was found that people with uh, uterine fibroids and thyroid nodules had TSHs of just above two. So if our TSH level is, is too high, we're gonna be missing all of these people that have um, an incidence of increased estrogen, inhibiting thyroid, and also increasing the, the amount of thyroid nodules that we have. Thyroid cancer has been increasing steadily. 
partly because uh, the diagnostic tools, it's a bit like having a bigger telescope, seeing more stars. The other uh, fact is that in a lot of studies and particular studies in America, they found that approximately 50% of people have thyroid nodules on autopsy. So that should tell us that something is disturbing thyroid function or it's just a normal finding. My, my guess would be that um, when you start to have increases in nodules, you're probably going to have increases in serum TSH. This is showing this, that the thyroid's not being, um, uh, it's not functioning effectively. And this might come from increased stress, poor diet, high, uh, diets high in unsaturated fatty acids, not enough available carbohydrates, perhaps some of the smaller micronutrients like iodine and selenium might be an issue as well. Or there's also a vast increase in environmental pollutants that inhibit thyroid function as well. So this brings me on to the study by Fiori and Vitti, and, and they showed that, 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 that for each rise in TSH, there's actually an increase of the incidence of findings of papillary thyroid cancer, which is the most common thyroid cancer. And thyroid cancers and, and, and tumors really account for about 2.2% of, of all new um, cancers uh, that are being found. So it's quite a high um, amount of cancer that's being found related to the thyroid function. And if we just scroll down here, we can see a number of studies where um, the findings of increases of TSH more so when TSH is above five or so. Uh, there's about a 29% in this particular study by Bolart in 2006. There's a very much smaller increase in thyroid um, cancers and, and tumors when, when it's in the lower end. So if it's below 0.4, which is suggested to be your uh, hyperthyroid state, there's, there was a 2.8% finding here. Again, in Haymart in 2008, they also found that there was a 16% when the TSH was below 0.4. 0, 06, but up to 52% when the TSH was above 5. So what should that start to tell us is A, um, TSH is not being measured effectively, i.e. could the TSH actually be lower to confirm the incidence of, of thyroid issues? Is that level of 4 just totally unrealistic? Um, is TSH itself a valid marker? Could we look at temperature? Could we be looking at symptoms that are well known with uh, hypothyroidism, which include uh, changes to uh, the menstrual cycle, infertility, constipation, loss of hair, gaining weight, cold feet? These are all um, valid symptoms that hypothyroid people experience, but there's a big, uh, there's a vast gap between hypothyroid and, and the, the um, euthyroid state, but also the subclinical hypothyroidism that gets lost in here. So if we are seeing an increase in TSH and an increase in thyroid nodules, and there's a link between uterine fibroids in this particular case, is prescribing estrogen-based contraceptive pills the answer for effectively resolving um, uterine fibroids? So if we know that estrogen inactivates thyroid, wouldn't the best approach be to either inactivate estrogen uh, decrease the the availability of estrogen, but also to to uh, use the thyroid effectively. It's well known that in endocrine studies that the the concept of TSH suppression therapy by prescribing a synthetic thyroid hormone is used quite effectively to lower to lower tumors. There have been some inconsistencies, but on the whole, there seems to be um, a very good case for prescribing thyroid um, to um, decrease the size of, of thyroid nodules and tumors. Now, shouldn't this be the case that we should be looking at to, to lower the incidence of uterine fibroids? If there is a gap between who's actually being effectively diagnosed, there's a finding of increased estrogen, there's a finding of suppressed thyroid, or at least we're finding uh, an incidence of thyroid nodules and uterine fibroids, then probably the best approach would be to make sure that the thyroid functions effectively, first through food, and if that doesn't work, perhaps then maybe the, 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 the use of uh, prescribing thyroid hormone. I have a preference more for natural desiccated thyroid hormone over synthetic because I, I just don't think it, it, it functions as well as it could do. But that's my, my opinion and that will differ and vary from, a, from a, a lot of other people that you might speak to. So my approach with this would be find out what the thyroid is doing, find out how much TSH there is, look at the other symptoms like temperature, pulse, um, all the symptoms that we just discussed and see if there's a link between thyroid inactivation, increases in TSH and other uterine fibroids being driven by a low thyroid state. And what can we do to help to detoxify estrogen more? What can we do to help to raise progesterone levels? Uh, progesterone is going to differentiate. We know that we're in, in, in many cancers, it is an excessive estrogen that causes uh, mitosis and all of the other negative uh, pathways that's associated with cancer development. 
So before you kind of go down the route of, of using a uh, prescription uh, or contraception, then this is a key mechanism that I think everybody should be doing when there have been findings of use or 